Hello everyone, this is Bob Brown with Community Coronavirus Update number 60. The table will talk about uh, leadership and requiring some expertise and empathy, uh, vaccine distribution issues, and some common questions. Uh, so last week was on an NET interview with uh, James Lawler, which was kind of nice because uh, I told James before the show that he's in some ways responsible for me cre creating these community updates. Uh, backstory is, is that uh, I was at an emergency LPS meeting and uh, had heard about this presentation given by an Omaha doctor to the Omaha uh, area superintendents and how it was a little scary. And I asked uh, Dr. Uh, Joel if he could get me a copy of that presentation. And so I, he sent me a copy of James's presentation, which was February 27th of 2020, I might add. Uh, in that presentation, he said, well, we could be looking at upwards of uh, 480,000 deaths in the United States. Uh, James told me when he put it out there, he didn't think it would be that bad because he thought we'd have a better response. Unfortunately, we didn't have a better response. Uh, and that's uh, much to his frustration and pretty much everybody else in public health. We could have avoided those deaths, but it doesn't look like we're going to. Uh, as of this morning, we're at 401,000 and, and counting, so it's likely we're going to exceed that amount, unfortunately, because the United States had such a disorganized, bad response to this whole pandemic. Uh, and so basically what I did is I took James's law numbers, and, and originally I thought he was overreacting until I reran my numbers myself, and I said, oh my gosh, I think he's right. Uh, and so what I did the very first episode was basically put the numbers on a Lincoln perspective, and here's a slide from the very first presentation, essentially breaking down those same numbers at a Lincoln level, you know, we could be looking at 600 fatalities. Unfortunately, well, the good thing is that Lincoln didn't hit that rate and doesn't look like we're going to because we mostly got it right. However, many areas around us didn't get it right and actually have done much worse. Uh, one way I like to look at it is by congressional district because you can see how much it varied from congressional district. And so the Dakotas and areas of Iowa actually were worse than James's predict predictions. Lincoln is much lower. Instead of 600, we're about 185 today. Uh, and so we're better than every surrounding district. Uh, and even within our own congressional district, we're, which we're about half of from a population standpoint, we're lower even within the district. And the, big, the number one reason is mask ordinances work. And we were the first ones to put in place. Uh, another way to look at it, at HealthyLincoln.org, we put together this way of looking at it, where you can look at four different regions. Uh, Lincoln, which has the mask ordinance, much lower. The uh, Omaha, which is partly covered uh, by a mask ordinance, but not completely, is a little is a little higher. And then the rest of the state that took longer to get anything like that in place has a much higher fatality rate. Uh, and so we know it's working. Uh, we just need to do more of it. Um, uh, I like this article from the New York Times talking about, well, we're underselling the vaccine. The vaccine is actually much better than, than we hoped. Uh, but, uh, unfor unfortunately, though, the vaccine rollout is much worse than hoped. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, I like his summary that he ends this, that we should immediately be more aggressive about mask wearing and social distancing because of the new virus variants. Uh, these new infectious variants uh, are, are popping up everywhere, and I think it's just part of the natural evolution of a virus. We need to quit letting it spread so much because every spread is an upper opportunity to mutate. Uh, and we need to do this, and then as soon as we get the vaccines, we need to roll it out as fast as we can, but that's not happening, unfortunately. Uh, we need to paint the picture of what could happen by doing this well, that we could be back together hugging our grandchildren and with, being with our family uh, by the summer if we get it right, but until then, then we need to keep wearing masks and do the right thing until everybody gets vaccinated. Uh, how are we doing in Nebraska? Well, you know, we, uh, we had our near disaster back in November. We averted that, had a little rebound after Thanksgiving. Huge drop, another rebound, unfortunately, after the holidays. And it looks like we're getting down lower. So it looks like more people are doing masks and wearing the right thing. Uh, we just need to do more of it. We are not in, we're not out of the red zone yet, folks, no matter what your politicians tell you. Uh, so we need to keep doing a better job with that. Um, uh, a friend of mine actually sent me this article a while back and was talking to me about it. And I like this Harvard Business Review article about uh, by uh, Lieutenant General William Pagotas about leadership in a combat zone. And basically he says it really boils down to expertise and empathy. And, and either one or both of these have been missing at all levels, uh, both federal, state, and local uh, to some degree. And so uh, an expertise is what's been most lacking. And so the frustration thing for us from a public health perspective is they're not involving any public health experts in the planning for the most part. And we've done this type of stuff before. Please involve us at some point. Um, you know, when I did my training at Johns Hopkins, uh, the first day of class essentially is public health problem solving. They walk you through the Johns Hopkins public health problem solving model. Uh, this eight step model was put together by the people who rid the world of smallpox, which is one of the best, biggest and best public health achievements of all time. Uh, the two things, the, the last ports in this are not the least important, sometimes they're the most important. Understanding the barriers and having an effective communication strategy are two of the most important things, and that's probably one of our biggest problems with the vaccine rollout, is this really hasn't been addressed. Um, you know, we still have bad, here's an example of bad communication strategy. I got my uh, coronavirus test a few weeks back and they keep sending these follow-ups and the email they send me is literally has incorrect information about coronavirus on it. And I've called to complain, they still haven't updated it. And so when your own state is putting out misinformation and bad communication, that's not a good communication strategy. 
uh, you know, we've, there's so many examples of doing this effectively. So this article about New York, uh, they had a smallpox pox, uh, outbreak in 1947. They actually vaccinated 6 million New Yorkers in a month. Uh, now that they did it all the right way. So Israel Weinstein, the health commissioner, you'll notice that he's both a PhD and an MD. So he is actually is a public health expert. Uh, they put the system, this uh, plan together. Uh, it started initially slowly, but took off really well. Uh, they kind of mentioned in the article about the smallpox, how that eradication was the most effective thing had done in public health ever, pretty much. Um, well, basically, during his Weinstein's uh, radio address, he followed the, the guidelines. One, first is you have to level with the public. Do not sugarcoat things. And that's what happened uh, wrong, is people didn't understand the full gravity of coronavirus because a lot of politicians over level, every level were minimizing it. We need the, the, real, uh, the better long-term strategy is to be very honest, frank, and forthright with the public. Here's what the numbers show. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. And be very very clear and consistent and have an expert spokesman and uh, who's the who is the public health expert spokesman that you're hearing uh, at either the state or local level I don't know uh, and so that's what we need and in a calm clear voice someone like this with a great message be sure be sure be safe get vaccinated we know what that message is and other countries have done it we need to start doing this in, in Lincoln um, you know, the biggest people who've not been involved are the pe very people who vaccinate people every year, year in and out. And so primary care doctors give the most vaccines every year. They're the people excluded from the planning process at every level, which is probably one of my biggest frustrations with the vaccine rollout. We have a great vaccine. Now we need to get it out effectively, but they're literally not involving primary care doctors in this. Uh, as I've said repeatedly, you know, we do this every year for influenza vaccination, which is the most comparable thing to what we're trying to do. We do this every year and get more than 80% of our Medicare population vaccinated every year, year in and year out. What I do for a living is I run this network of physicians, which is about half of Lincoln's physicians, plus a few more in Grand Island, uh, Crete, and Auburn. Uh, and then before that, I actually helped set up the Southeast Rural Physicians Alliance, ACO. We regularly do this, but we've not been involved in the planning at any level, which is much to our frustration. Uh, you know, the Wilmbank article talks about why do primary care doctors do a good job? Well, one, we already have the trusted relationship with these patients. Uh, we have a communication pipeline. We have their uh, contact information. They know who we are. Uh, we're there. We're local. Uh, that's why you should involve primary care doctors. And again, we're the one. We do all kinds of vaccinations every year, and that's who the public trusts. Um, the problem with the state is that the vaccine is just taking too long to go from fridge to arms. And so, you know, vaccines don't save lives until they get into somebody's arm. We have over 80,000 sitting in refrigerators. That should be getting out within days to the people who need it most. And unfortunately, that's not happening as efficiently, as effectively as it should be. Um, part of the problem is that there's no overall uh, communication strategy, even amongst the healthcare uh, entities. So hospitals, pharmacies, community health centers, they get the vaccine distributed to them. The state and local health department are supposed to be organizing this, but they're not even talking to each other, much less everybody else. And us local docs, we're sitting here scratching our heads saying, okay, what's the plan? Uh, and so if you're confused, well, join the club. Uh, I and uh, all my physician colleagues are just as confused as you are as to what the plan is and when it's going to happen. Uh, like I say, vaccines don't work until they become vaccinations, so we need to get this ironed out hopefully in the coming weeks. Um, you know, how do we doing in Nebraska? We started, we had a good start, at least with the healthcare uh, folks and nursing homes, but unfortunately we're starting to fall behind. So as of this morning in the Washington Post, uh, here's the, you know, who's, who's, do, who's doing its best. I think they have a good visualization of this. Uh, we're down to number 16 now because the rest are, are jumping up ahead of us. Uh, one example is West Virginia. Uh, why of all people are West Virginia doing it right? Uh, well, one thing is I think they decided not to go with the overly centralized CVS and Walgreens approach. They started to work with mom and pop pharmacies. So if you'd work with mom and pop pharmacies, local folks, local primary care doctors, I think you'd do it a lot better. And I think West Virginia is getting it right because they work with the local people and they didn't try to plan it all from above without involving the key players. Uh, you know, I got my vaccine Thursday last week, uh, the first dose. I got it at Blue Stem Health, a primary local primary health clinic. The Kimmy Health Centers did get some vaccine, unlike all the other primary care doctors. They had a nice setup. Uh, actually, I was in and out uh, pretty quickly. They, they did a good job. Uh, they were getting ready to ramp up to 100 a day. Uh, I think if we added some volunteers and extended their hours, they could probably do even more. And every clinic, and uh, well, most clinics in town could be doing this within a week or two if they would at least involve us in the planning and let us and get us some of the vaccine. We can get it in arms and in the general public one of the barriers is trust and so who do people trust the most to get a vaccine their physician's office the very people that have been excluded from any part of the planning at the state or local level uh, the good news is the state did release its plan suddenly uh, in the last couple days and they are planning to involve the physician's offices so there is a way for your local physician office to designate themselves although the process still isn't clear yet uh, or how exactly we get the vaccine it's likely weeks off unfortunately but at least the state is has now developed an option to start working with us. So that's one positive development. 
Uh, you know, we need to work on trust, especially in our minority low-income populations. African Americans have a history of uh, distrust of the healthcare system because of uh, a lot of bad history, unfortunately, and, and, and cer certainly warranted. And so one thing we've done locally for the flu shot campaign is we drew, drew, <clears throat> drew from people in our minority community to help carry the message to their folks, uh, especially the African American community, and I think this has been very helpful. Uh, some of these folks are great people to work with uh, in our local community. And so we need to have a combination of local uh, recognized people and physicians carrying the message to overcome some of the trust issues. Uh, again, you know, I think this is still spot on. We had great research. The Operation Warp Suite is a great idea, but the distribution planning is still, unfortunately, kind of in this stage right now. Uh, best advice for you right now because of all these mixed messages and things being released and walked back. Uh, I would sign up through your local health department uh, when it's live. It is live here in Lincoln, for example. Other health departments have put that up live today. There's not a rush. It doesn't matter if you do it today or three days from now. The vaccine's not ready to be released to you for a few weeks now. I would go ahead and sign up when it's at, out, uh, when, it, when you're ready. I wouldn't do it today because I think the website's still crashing a little bit or really delayed. Uh, wait for the load to go down. I would sign up through the state website as well uh, when it's open uh, and hope see which one of them ends up becoming the real site because uh, hopefully they'll start working together at some point. Uh, and if either gets around these folks, either the local or state level, decide to talk to us at some point, your local physicians will be ready and we will call you when they actually do involve us and give us some vaccine. Uh, so I'd say take, take kind of the three trying strategy until the state gets a little more organized, sign up for both, and then uh, we'll, we'll, if, if we find out, us local doctors will let you know. Um, as far as trust, you know, some people have been a little worried about <clears throat> were some uh, corners cut when they uh, released the vaccine. Actually, there were no, even though it was faster, no corners were cut. And what happened is they switched from a uh, doing the whole vaccine process in series to doing it in parallel. Whoever came up with the idea of Operation Wart Speed deserves a Congressional Medal of Honor for figuring this out. Essentially, what they did is they took all the meetings around financial and risk and all these other things. They cut the, the waste out, essentially. It can be done faster. The problem is there's so much financial risk that it's a slow process because of the financial risk. And what Operation Warp Speed did is, is they took out the financial risk of developing a vaccine so that what happens, the magazine folks were able to do almost all of these in parallel rather than series. And that's why it came out faster. It wasn't because they cut any corners. They did stage one and two pretty much at the same time. And as soon as they were ready for that, they got started on stage three. Stage three vaccine development has tens of thousands of participants. So if there's a uh, common side effects, you'll find them. Uh, those studies were better than anticipated. They had an emergency meeting. And while this was happening, they basically ramped up production ahead of time so that when, as soon as this was uh, was announced, they had stuff ready to ship. And that's why it was able to come out so fast. It was not because they cut out corners. In stage four, they, we still study safety even in stage four. Uh, so for example, when you get your vaccine, you have the option of signing up on vSafe with a smartphone app, and that app will actually send you messages every day to check on your symptoms, and that's how they're monitoring. So they have tens of million, uh, over 10 million doses given out. A lot of people, mostly doctors and nurses, for example, are, are monitoring themselves so that they're literally helping you figure out that, that whether this is safe or not. Uh, what I'm finding uh, from my colleagues is that the first dose, uh, very few side effects other than a sore arm. Second dose, pretty common for people to have uh, some achiness, some chills, being tired, you know, people want to sleep in. So people try to get the vaccine <clears throat> on like a Thursday or a Friday, for example, so that if, or, you know, before they have a day off so they can relax. Uh, but <clears throat> mostly that's about it for the second dose. So mo no, very few severe reactions. There are a few serious reactions that you're hearing about in the newspaper, but those are very, very small. Last I heard was 11 per million. That's a hard number to even understand because it's pretty dang low. One way to think of it is to visualize it and put it in perspective versus coronavirus deaths. So if you look at the rate of serious vaccine reactions versus the rate of people who've already died in the United States, it's over 100 times more than the other ones. So the risk you're taking with a vaccine is so low, and it's basically a, serious, a reaction like an allergic reaction where they might have an EpiPen. That's why you should have, be, have this done at a healthcare facility because if you do have an allergic reaction, they can readily treat it. Uh, I don't think so. This is a very safe thing to get, and nowhere comparison as far as the risk of dying from getting coronavirus the hard way. Uh, and so the vaccine is very safe. Uh, why should you still wear a mask and avoid crowds? You need to keep wearing a mask even if you get the vaccine. And there's a couple reasons for this. One is it takes six weeks to get full immunity. Uh, two, it's not 100% effective. It was 95% of it effective, but one out of 20 times it might not be. Uh, also, it's going to be almost impossible to police who does and does not need to be wearing a mask. Uh, you're not going to have people wearing letters around saying I got a vaccine and others not. It creates a haves and haves not situation. It would be a nightmare to try to police this. So everybody needs to wear a mask until enough people get vaccinated that we hit herd immunity and those infections start dropping like a rock, then you can quit wearing your mask. Uh, but if we get this right, we can keep Nebraska deaths below 2,000. Uh, again, like I keep saying below, basic control measures, wear a mask, avoid the crowd, keep your distance, and get vaccinated eventually when your number is called. It'll happen. It's just not been near as smooth as we'd hoped. 
Uh, so hopefully this is helpful to you. Uh, this is what I do for a living. It's a disclaimer. It's my opinions, not necessarily speaks, but this is so you know I'm not just uh, some crazy conspiracy theorist. Uh, this is what I, where I work, and of course all past episodes are on the healthylinkin.org website.